Heavy Cardboard, Episode 23, Ground Floor. Coming to you from the thunderstorm capital of the U.S., west of Florida, Denver, Colorado. Welcome to Heavy Cardboard, where we talk heavy and medium strategy board games, war games, 18xx, and other related topics on the board gaming hobby. I'm your host, Edward. I'm the other host, Tony. So... Uh, first off, we figured we'd uh, start off by letting you guys know how to get in touch with us. Sure. First off, on the web, our website, heavycardboard.com, Twitter, at heavycardboard, Facebook, heavycardboard, email, wait for it, heavycardboard at gmail.com, and YouTube, um, obviously, for those watching uh, on YouTube, you found us. But for those listening, uh, head to the website. We'll have the YouTube stuff hammered out by the time this uploads. Not quite ready yet. Yeah. So uh, uh, last but not least, um, if you guys would, continue to take a few minutes and review us on iTunes. It's very much appreciated. And uh, a lot of people actually have taken the time since our last episode. Um, Give a shout out to some of those names. Yeah, so here are the reviews that have been left on iTunes. So a big thank you goes out to Mayneric, Solo Slayer 87, Lunar Knight, JJ Kuhn, Jason B1002, and PAH937. Much appreciated, guys. Please continue Definitely. leaving the, uh, the reviews and ratings on iTunes. It not only helps the show and gets more eyes and, and ears on us, but... Yeah. Uh, but we appreciate just reading them. I mean, it brightens my day. If I'm having a crappy day at work and I see a new review, my day's a little less crappy at work now. Indeed. Yeah, so good stuff. Let's also remind everybody about our great sponsors, Game Surplus. Great people, great games at great prices. Check them out on the web, www.gamesurplus.com. Yeah, just quality people and uh, somebody we, we're proud to be associated with. Let them know that uh, Heavy Cardboard sent you, too. On that note, they have been gracious enough to give us a game for a giveaway. So we are going to be giving away a copy of Vladimir Suchi's uh, Shipyard, which we've reviewed in a previous podcast. Yes. And we both thoroughly enjoy. It's a terrific game. Yeah. R- r- uh, spread the love type thing, right? Yeah. So... Uh, Thanks to Game Surplus for allowing us to do that. And all you have to do to enter is email us at contest at heavycardboard.com. Notice the change in the email address for, for the contest. For the contest. Um, and two things. First off, tell us how you first heard about the show. Mm-hmm. And secondly, tell us what game you're most excited to play for the first time in 2015, whether it's a 2015 release or something new to you in right. 2015. Right, just new to you in 2015. And we'll just do our normal pull a rabbit out of the hat and pick something at random, and that'll be the winner and the recipient of Shipyard from Game Surplus and Heavy Cardboard. Yeah, and as far as shipping goes, in the U.S., it's free, it's on us, we'll, we'll cover that. If it's outside the U.S., you are more than welcome to enter. We'll cover the fifth, first 15 bucks for shipping. And uh, you guys meet us the rest of the way. Cool. Cool. All right. So it feels like we've been, it's been a while since we've recorded last. It, because uh, April was one of those weird months in that it had the extra week, right. the fifth week. And we normally release every, the first and third Thursday of every month. But we, you did an amazing job of editing the, the last episode so, so fast that we actually released it a couple days early. We, we released it on Tuesday instead of Thursday. So it feels like, truly, it feels like it's been a month since we last recorded. It's been crazy. Uh, true. That that does have its benefits. It only happens twice a year. <laughs> but uh, the, they do have their benefits, as will be apparent to our uh, listeners Yeah, uh, <laughs> as we go in here. Plus, I mean, as much as I love recording the podcast and everything, it's a lot of work. So it was yeah. kind of a... Nice break to sure. get away from the deadline. Yeah. You know, the, the I guess, self-imposed deadlines for being able to play games a yeah. certain amount of times and all that. But, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's nice. As we'll discuss, we certainly took advantage of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, 
normally we record on Mondays, right. um, as we are tonight, uh, but we're trying something different. We uh, uh, got the video camera going. You can see us. Right. And for better or for worse. Mm, probably and worse. so this is going to be posted on our YouTube page, obviously, right, as, right. We, as we mentioned. So um, give us feedback. If you guys are digging it, let us know. If mm-hmm. you want us to never do this again, let us know that just nicely, please. <laughs> um, we are people, too. You're right. We, we have feeling. A feeling. So, Saturday was the big fight. I know you're not a big fight fan. That's a disgusting sport. Uh, if you say so. So, Amanda and I used to live in Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. And we're both big fight fans. We we went to a bunch of the, you know, yeah. high-end uh, I like championship you in spite fights. Of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Saturday was the big Manny Pacquiao and uh, Floyd Mayweather fight. And it was a huge letdown because it went like almost every other Mayweather fight. It's just, he is a master of defense. The dude just doesn't get hit. Hmm. And it makes for very boring fights, but give credit to him because he's the best of our generation. I don't like him. I was rooting for Manny, but had I laid money on the fight, it would have been on Mayweather. So I'm going to break out a reference that may surprise you, but is that like a, a one nothing baseball game, which is kind of well, see, because the defense is so awesome or the pitching is so awesome? It, I guess kind of, but at the same time, see, I appreciate a baseball game like that. I, I As a former pitcher, I appreciate the finer things. You know, a, a sure, pitcher's sure. duel in that. Well, but. how about how about the sport that fighting's okay in hockey? Oh, absolutely, a one nothing hockey game. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the end, I'm just glad we didn't have to pay for it. We went over to a, 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 a one of Amanda's friends' house to watch sure. the game. Had a bunch of people. It was a good time. Uh, so even though the the fight was kind of eh, it, it was cool to go over there and hang out. Right on. Um, so it's spring here in Denver. <laughs> And the reason we know this is there's no snow anywhere, number one. And number two, ju- a lot like Florida, we get thunderstorms yeah. almost daily. Spring has sprung a leak. Seriously. Every year it does that here. Yeah, and it's not. So Asher, our, our poor greyhound, hates oh. this time of year. Yeah, our, our dogs too. Yeah, the, not a fan of thunder. No, the other night, man, like at 1 a.m., right? Buddha, the dog, <laughs> in the bed. <laughs> <laughs> Hold me. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so, a couple other things. Um, I'm getting really, really excited for HeavyCon. That's a few weeks away. Oh, yeah, man. Memorial Day weekend. Yep. Um, along with that excitement, I'm also extremely nervous because it's the first time we've ever hosted that. We have a bunch of people coming out from out of town. Um, we got about 16, 17 people mm-hmm. total. And going to be a lot of fun. We'll be tweeting out pictures left and right oh, yeah. and and maybe even recording a, uh, a pod blast during it and we'll, we'll see we'll play around with will that splendor idea, but... get played there no no <laughs> <laughs> i mean uh so i started a geek list on board game geek for those attending mm-hmm. to chime in and and try and organize hey what games do we want to play and man the list is is Heavy and long. It's and awesome. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know what I want to do. I have some ideas, and I'm going to talk about one of them because um, somebody asked a question about that. But right. Wow. Yeah. I. What the con's going to be three days: Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Mm-hmm. And what I've realized is it should have been about 17 days for all the games that are getting mentioned and want to get day. played. Yeah. One so day. We'll get there. Well, once we win the lottery, you no longer have to work. A gathering of heavy friends, although that sounds... Girthy friend? Yeah, moving on. Yeah. So, um, this summer, I have a goal for the show. Okay. And tell me what you think of this. Right, fire. Uh, I say that either in June or July, we do our first completely 18xx-centric show. And what I mean by that is we discuss what 18xx's are. Okay. Why to, we to our abilities anyway? Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Why we dig them? Why we think they're awesome? Why right. we enjoy them? Right. Um, and we review, you know, one main feature review like we normally do. Say eighteen forty six, maybe eighteen thirty, something along those lines. Eighteen seventy nine. Right. Oh, well, and and kind of you know discuss sure. the ones that we've played and everything. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that'd be a good goal. So I'm putting you on the spot. On on tape and on film. All right, as it were, video film. You get the idea. Yeah, digital. What do you think? I love the idea. As you well know, I am a recent um, 
person to be infected with the 18xx bug which hopefully is contagious and, right. and spreads <laughs> right and so uh i'm totally in with that and you know we've played 1846 we played 1879 there's some others yeah let's do it all right cool is june too soon maybe it's july just yeah, c- because sure. it's already may you know right but, right right yeah. i yeah let's let's shoot for that cool and we're we, you know you and i are talking about forming a heavy cardboard game group here in the denver area and uh my proposition to you was the first Saturday of every month is 18xx day. Sign me up. Done. Yes. So, I. Yeah. I maybe absolutely. it's not the first Saturday, but you get what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Let, yeah. Regular 18xx play. Yes. Because I'm hooked. I'm smitten. Deal. All right. All right. So, what have you acquired recently? Well, um, 1830. The Mayfair. The Mayfair. Edition, right. There's the, a copy of it right there. Sure. Um, Proof of my infection, <laughs> and um, a game that uh, you're going to talk about, and we've both been recently introduced to uh, Arboretum. Yeah, rock on. That's um, all I've acquired. Though. That's it. That that's, was it. So it's been almost a month since I, our last. Podcast, I've been too busy playing it? games to buy games. Good problem to have, I with guess. little exception. All right. Yeah. So for me, uh, what, the first one was a happy accident. So I'm pretty active in board game geek auctions. I'll uh, just you know it's you uh, you know it's kind of a secondhand store auction thing, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, well, you're a collector, partial collector. Okay. I think it's fair, as you guys can see, because mm-hmm. I think the camera stops here, but there's a this yeah. doubled up there. Right. But anyway, it's fifty percent um, of the picture there. Yeah, right. Plus minimum, plus yeah. all that. Yeah. But anyway, uh, so. A gentleman had Strasbourg, which is a older Stefan Feld yeah. game that I played for the first time over at your house. Right. You have a copy, yeah. and it's got a really, really cool auction mechanic that we love auctions. That I don't know that anything else out there does what this does. Yeah, it's pretty and unique. Yeah, I thought so, and I think we enjoyed it enough to where I'd like a copy. Sure. So he had it up there. I threw out a bid for thirty-five bucks, which is below the reserve, just you know, just in case. Right. No one else bid, and mm. I got it, and he accepted the bid, so rock on. So Strasbourg has since made it its way here. I think uh, Strasbourg's probably in the top half of Feld's catalog, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's a, that's a, yeah, a definite there. Uh, so I also acquired a copy of Arboretum, which I'll talk right, about here right. more in a little bit. We got but, our copies together. Yes, yeah. Uh, right after playing it at the Conclave for the first time. Right. As soon as I played it, I had heard it on the Punching Cardboard podcast okay. the day before. And the guys were just raving about it. So I was like, <clears throat> cool, I'll check into it. Just so happened that our buddy Jim happened to bring oh, right. it the next day. And I was like, oh, sweet, I just heard about this game. Let's try it. As soon as I got done, uh, found us a couple copies and, yeah. and done, sold, bought. I, I didn't even... Uh, get a chance to play with you in that game and you're like this is awesome i'm, I'm gonna like, buy one right now and i just said just based on what you said it's 15 two. bucks get two <laughs> right. yeah yeah exactly so the other thing that i wanted to uh, that i i slash we have recently acquired was yesterday on sunday um well i guess saturday got a package in the mail from our buddy kevin mm-hmm. out in kansas city who we met through paul chad uh also good friend of ours uh, friend of the show, yep, obviously. Indeed. So apparently, there's been some stuff going on in the background that I have not known about because they got my wife involved regarding this, and so they she knew it was coming. She didn't know all the details of what this sure. care package was. Okay. So included in this care package, first off, uh, inside the box was uh, Kevin had made me a custom box for 18 AL. Right. Gorgeous. I had seen one that he had made. I mean, literally from scratch. The whole box is made from scratch. Uh, he had made it for Paul Chad's copy. And my copy is a print and play production or, or a homemade that I'd gotten secondhand. And mm. I had been, it had been stored in a Combat Commander uh, Resistance Sim game. game. And it's just, it's looked weird. Yeah. And so, in fact, oh, oh, it's now it's in the box. Yeah, actually, All got right. it. And so Kevin made this for me because yeah, I was giving him grief. I was yeah. like, "Hey, how come? How come I don't have <laughs> right?" <laughs> and so I, I was I was half kidding when I said it, but 
he was willing to make it. So, yep. so this is what everything came in. So inside of there were uh, a copy of 1879 that he sent to us yep. that was extra and which was, I was flabbergasted. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, because it's a winsome game, hard to get, expensive, et cetera, et cetera. But the reason I wanted it is it's kind of a riff off of 1830 right. is because it's the Pacific Northwest, which is where I'm from. Right, right. And so I thought, wow, I, I, was, I was blown away by that. So continuing with this, um, Paul Chad had brought up two copies of SNCF for us That's as right. well uh, that he had that he got. Dude's awesome. It just, I, I mean, it was it was an embarrassment of riches on Sunday. So Paul Chad brought those up, and so we had those. We had 1879, which we also played right. and and enjoyed with NCSF. S and blah, SNC, blah. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Paris Connection, right, is the is the reprint of it by Queen Games. By Queen Games, right, right. If you're not familiar, <clears throat> we we love the game. Yeah, it's he- it's heavy filler, 10, 15 minute filler that is impressive. The amount of game There's that's thought. that's in there, and yeah. so yeah, really good game. So the coup de gras though is <laughs> is was was a total surprise. So Kevin made a custom. Age of Steam map for heavy cardboard. Uh, it's been pretty well tested by some Age of Steam experts. I mean, they the the level of play that of those guys in Kansas City have is uh, is pretty pretty impressive. And so they went and they made us this map, or they made the map for us for to, heavy cardboard, right, to uh, commemorate our one year anniversary yeah. of the show, which is coming up, and just blown away by it it's it, instead of the city names it's uh it's games that we reviewed it's games that we reviewed the the little iconography on the city is the denver skyline right just you know, and and it's got our little logo in the center hex and that right. plays an important role in the game it does it's it's almost like a cube fountain that, yeah. uh, instead of the normal production in age yeah. of steam and we we busted it out now i had played age of steam twice before and i had and never played it and I really did not enjoy Age of Steam. And so this was partially done uh, as Kevin's way of trying to yeah. coerce me <laughs> to, to play it again and see if I could get into it. And I'd be damned if it didn't work. Um, and I, I can't say that playing on our own map didn't play a part. Mm -hmm. Also the fact that I won, which never hurts. Um, but I really enjoyed the game. I think the problem that I'd had in the past was the fact that the maps that I, I played on right. for the player count just didn't sure. didn't work right. And it was either just boring or blasé. Yeah. Um, it just didn't work right. This, at four players, was awesome. It was, in, blast. It was intense. It was my first game mm -hmm. of, of Age of Steam. So I had no preconceived notions. Although I've played Steam many times before. Mm -hmm. So I had... A general gist of what to do and um yeah that map was uh tight and intense with four and i'm anxious to try it i would five. love to try it with five um i my at the end of the game i was like i need to like sell my copy of steam and get age of steam <laughs> it's a fun game yeah it was, it was good so a a really really big genuine heartfelt thank you goes out to kevin to Paul Chad Indeed. and also to the guys uh, mm. of the uh, in the Kansas City area that helped uh, play test it. Apparently, yep. I, Chatty Boy, um, Open, Open Face, Face. Chad, um, and all the other guys. So thank you, genuinely. Thank you very much. I just totally humbled, blown away. Just yeah, that was awesome. Now, when this episode airs, or shortly thereafter, Kevin is going to upload the files for this map to BGG on the Age of Steam forum, so yep. that. If you guys want to print your own heavy cardboard map and give it a fly, and, and why rules, wouldn't you? <laughs> it's uh, it's pretty damn cool. It's pretty good map. Yeah, yeah. rock on. So again, thanks guys. Really appreciate it. Right on. So that's all I've acquired. Long way to go about it, but it was uh, yeah. I think it was it was fitting. So other than Princes of Renaissance or whatever the hell that Martin <laughs> Wallace game is that you can never. Um, what are you hunting? Oh, so other than Princes of the Renaissance? Yes. 
Really, honestly, not much. I mean, yeah. I would like to try out uh, Argent the Consortium because we didn't get a chance to play yeah. that at the Conclave. But see, I don't want to acquire it to try. Sure, it. I want I want to try someone else's copy right. first, right? Other than that, I mean, sure, I'd love to find a copy of 18 Arden for a cheap price or whatever. But honestly, I'm still kind of in a not really looking for mm -hmm, anything. Mm -hmm. If if something, you know, shows itself and sure. it's a really good deal sure. and it's something that, oh, yeah, hey, I've been meaning to get that. Great. Otherwise, yeah, not much. You? I, I would like to acquire on the SNCF kick mm -hmm. Northern Pacific. That's a winsome game as it's well, a, right? It's another little winsome micro. And okay. um, I recently just reached out to a BGG user who shows one for trade. And he's like, no, I like it. I'm like, well, you have it for trade. He goes like, oh, that was an extra copy that I sold. Sorry. Ouch. I was like, That's, bummers, man. Yeah, that, okay. But when you say micro game, what, what exactly do you mean by that? Um, you can place a train or a cube. During, right? It's, it's micro in, in the sense that SNCF is micro. There's Your choice uh, during the turn is this or this. But the thought involved in that simple choice. Gotcha. It, it, short playtime as well? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I know you and Paul Chad have talked about it, mm -hmm. uh, especially like while we're playing SNCF yes. or whatever. I'm not familiar with it, so I, I, I'd yeah. like you to get a copy so that I could try it. Yeah, and, you know, Northern Pacific, also up your alley. Right. Right. Um, well, let's see. As I alluded to earlier, mm -hmm. we took advantage of the extra week since the uh, recording. Felt like a month, as you said. Right. We, In we, a good way, though. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. We've been playing a crap ton of games, <laughs> and I'm just going to throw out a whole bunch of games here. Okay. That you've Mo played Most since. of which okay. we've played together. So mm -hmm. so some of these I, I have not played with you in, in that period of time. So as I rip through this list, if there's something we played together, chime up. And okay. then what have you played that I haven't? All right. Rock and roll? Um, obviously Arboretum. Sure. We, we I know we played 1846. Yep. We, we played Carson City, and that was a bit of a mistake. Yeah, and the reason that was a mistake is I, I've been wanting to try it, and you just recently got the expansion. Golden for, Guns. Right. Thank from, you, Game Surplus. Right, exactly. Uh, but it was the last game on Saturday night of the con. Hmm. We were all that yeah. we played at five player. We were all mentally exhausted and I think three or four of us hadn't played it before and trying yeah. to learn a new game like that. Even though it's not a real complex game, not a real heavy game, no. just no, bad idea. No one was in the in the right frame of mind. Too. So, so it was a, it was an awful experience. Yeah, we really didn't enjoy it. But because we know what uh, like Dude, where we were mentally, when I got home, I put it on the auction shelf. <laughs> Did you? It was that bad of an experience. <laughs> I want to Maybe play I it again. Maybe I should rethink that. Yeah, I okay. want to play it again, and I'm not saying it shouldn't be on the auction shelf, but I'm willing to try right, right, it when right. we're fresh. Right, okay. Um, SNCF, we're always playing that. Facts in five. We we played that at the Conclave of Gamers, too. Right, so one night... I, I Oh, it was... Wait, it was Christmas Day. Uh, Paul Chad had come over to our house, because he okay. doesn't have family in town. Right. And so we were like, hey, you want to come over for dinner, and we'll play some games and right. stuff. So he did. And one of the games that he brought was Faxon 5. Dude, and it's from like the 60s. It's yeah, 60s. It's like an Avalon Hill bookshelf game. That's exactly yeah, what okay, it is, okay. right. But it's an old school trivia game, but not in a normal sense. It's, uh, hey... Uh, draw these draw draw cards and pick one, right. and it's going to be name countries and it. Well, it's just it's like trivia categories, sure. And you and they're getting drafted into the game, right? And you have to list them. The kicker is there's a timer, <laughs> and I don't Five care minutes. how smart you are or how much you know. As soon as somebody hits that button on the timer, yeah. all knowledge just seeps out of your head instantly. Name people whose name starts with T. Go. Uh, 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 I mean, you're right, man. It's just <laughs> blank. But it, it was so much fun to play it then three player. And then we busted it out at the co or he busted it out at the conclave. And I want to say we played it like 10 or 12 players. And it was just hysterical. And because somebody be like, Oh, I got Qatar because it was like countries and one Coastal of the letters. Coastal countries that start with a Q. Right. And <laughs> nobody could figure one out. And then when somebody got they're like, oh, obviously, yeah, I should have gotten that, whatever. But just, it was hysterical. It was, fun. It, it was a lot of fun. 
Uh, clearly, we've been playing a lot of Ground Floor. I, I've heard of that. Uh, I've played some 20th Century. I know that wasn't with you. Right, but it's it's one of the challenge games from the Punching Cardboard guys. Obviously, Age of Steam on our on our heavy cardboard map. <laughs> right. Uh, Marco Polo played that twice. Two different paths won the games. Okay, well, that's encouraging because I'll, I'll be honest. Um, I've heard... Yeah, I know it's coming out because it's already out in Europe. Right, but there's and I, and an I English, got one of those. There's an English version yeah. coming out later. It's on language this year. agnostic, and but I'll be honest, a lot of what I've heard, and it's all coming from the gathering of friends, mm-hmm. um, wasn't positive about the yeah, game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, saying really unbalanced and this and that, but so far, good, good. Indications uh, on your end? Well, I mean, so two games. Or, or two or so, late. I mean, I, I'm not going to agree or disagree with anyone on the imbalance. I think, first of all, any time that you have asymmetrical stuff like that, mm-hmm. <laughs> good luck balancing that. Right. Second of all, this is a light family game. I'm not playing it because it's balanced or unbalanced or, you know what I mean? I, it's not a serious game. If it was a serious game and unbalanced, I'd have an issue with it. Okay, yeah. so it's shorter play time and yeah. all that, right? It's okay. like 20 minutes a player. And it's pretty. It's gorgeous. All right. Crokinole, we had a heavy cardboard Crokinole tournament at the Conclave of Gamers. It was impromptu. Right. We had it, some time to kill. It was us two and our buddies, Banker Dave and Brian. Um, we both advanced. And then you had, it was either 125 to 15 or 135 to 15 lead. Yeah. And you played to 150, and you didn't score again from no. that point. So that was, it, I, it, I, I did a little happy dance. It was like that old, what was it, Houston Oilers, Buffalo Bills playoff game where it was like 38 to nothing at halftime and the Bills came back and won. <laughs> That's pretty much what <laughs> yeah. it was. It was awesome. Huge bragging rights for another year. You're Frank Reich. <laughs> um, through the ages, first time I'd played that. Right. You and, taught. And so what were your thoughts? It was incredible. Yeah, it's I. I, I have, want to get a copy, but you're saying wait to the new edition. Yeah, I, I, and our buddy Paul Grogan is saying wait to the new edition. Right, and I have a hard time calling labeling a specific game my favorite game because mm-hmm. you know there's. Well, I've heard you say that about a couple. Right, so and so that's there, proof that of there what are you're saying. There, right, but if you put a gun to my head and said, "Look, you have to choose one game." I might lean towards Through the Ages, Mm -hmm. even though I think I've only played it four or five times. Um, I I think that's probably my favorite game. So I'm I'm really glad that you you dug that. Uh, We have one play so far of a prototype that we're working on in the heavy cardboard laboratories. Right. Um, So that's enough said. Okay. (laughs) Moving on. (laughs) Uh, I played an abstract game called Six. Played it like six times in six minutes. Okay. And uh, I never need to do that again. Okay. But I was uh, making someone happy at the Conclave. Uh, Orléans. Which uh, I'm looking forward to the deluxe copy uh, that I backed on Kickstarter yeah. to get here. I think it's going to be in the uh, winter. But yeah, the, good game. Fun. Good stuff. I got some Agricola in at the Conclave. Cool. That was without you. That was with Banker Dave yep. and, uh, and our friend Matt from mm-hmm. New Mexico. Caverna, Fields of Arla, a little bit of a Uva Rosenberg run there for me. <laughs> uh, Container, got a got an awesome four player round of that in that conclave. Um, I'm hoping to get that played at the uh, at HeavyCon. Oh, it's gonna. Okay, good. Innovation. That's Carl Chuddick's, mm. uh I don't know if it's his first game, but earlier than like Glory to Rome right, and stuff right. like that, right? Multi use cards, so. right? Which is kind of his hallmark because he's done that with um, Impulse. He's got Warrior those Rome. new ones, Motanai or yeah, it's got a weird game, but or yeah. a weird name, but yeah. it's getting positive buzz that I've heard so far. For the most so part. what I haven't played Innovation. What do you think of that? Uh, stick with Glory to Rome, really, or, or some other or Impulse and stuff like that. Yeah, it just wasn't. It had some really cool ideas, but overall, I didn't really enjoy it all that much. Huh. Okay. Yeah. All right. Airlines Europe, okay. Tashkent, 1879. That's the end of that list. Oh. What, what have uh, what have I missed that you've gotten exposed uh, to? Let's see. So, uh, played Metropolis or Metropolis. I'm not yeah. sure of the pronunciation on that. It's with yeah. the Y S. Yeah. But uh, ugly as sin board, but really cool bidding game. I've only got to play that like a couple times. It's really awesome. Yeah, good good stuff. Uh, played Bus, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, that was my first game at the Conclave um, with Paul mm-hmm. Chad and Jim. It was Jim's first time playing it. He really enjoyed it. And I'm convinced that the when I taught you the game, I completely butchered it um, because you hated it. I did. I mean, just I did. pure I, object I, just I hate. purposefully, in my turns, brought the end of the game on. Right. You were trying to just get this rip the space-time continuum. And, right, right. right. Yeah. But you're willing to give it another try right, because... Boo on me. Good. All right, rock on. Other than that, um, you know that 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 heavy cardboard prototype that's inspired by Indonesia that yes. we're not going to talk about, but hopefully get played. Right. Uh, at heavy con. At heavy yeah, con. We won't talk about that. Never heard it. All right. Heard what? Mm-hmm. Crickets. All right. It's time for heavy cardboard's take on Arboretum. Edward. Yeah. So Arboretum. A uh, small little card game came out this year. In fact, a month or two ago, right. I think, 2015. Designed by Dan Kassar. Published by Z-Man Games. Mm-hmm. Uh, it plays two to four players. I've played it two and three player myself. I think you've played it two to all three. three. Okay. Um, takes anywhere from, I'd say, 10 on the low end, 10 to 15 minutes, up to maybe 30 minutes at yeah. most. Yeah. Um, so what's going on in the game? Arboretum's a set collection and kind of tile placement card game. Uh, Here, hand me that box, sir. Oh. I'm going to watch while you talk. All right. So, it's a set collection, kind of tile placement card game. The game consists of a deck of 80 cards. There are 10 different suits, uh, each number 1 through 8, and each uh, of the suits are a different color and different type of tree, or a different species of tree, as it were. The number of players dictates how many species of trees you're going to play with. So out of those, you know, 10 decks, if you're playing two player, you're going to take four of those uh, sets out to where you're only playing with six of the different species. Mm -hmm. Each player is dealt seven cards to start, and players take turn drawing two cards from either the deck or any mix of the player's discards. Then they play one card and start building their own arboretum or, or your own tableau. And then you discard one card. Very simple mechanically. Yes. The placement of the card that you play, though, must be orthogonally adjacent to any other card in your tableau. And the game ends when the duck runs out, and then the players attempt to score That's each, spe- each species of tree. Whoever has the highest score wins the game. So, like I said, it's, it's a really simple game mechanically, but there's real genius in the building of your arboretum, and the brutal choice of what to discard and the equally kind of painful scoring mechanic. Yeah, you get to this point where you got seven cards in your hand. Well, eight, really, because you've just played one into your Arboretum, and now you have to discard down to seven, and you're like, Ugh. I don't want to get rid of any of these because they either play in my Arboretum or in someone else's. Or it's lessening your score in a particular species. It's brutal. Right. And so let me take a minute and explain how that works. So to score a species of tree at the end of the game, a player must have a minimum of two trees bookending in an orthogonally adjacent ascending set of cards. Mm -hmm. So it can snake through your arboretum, whatever. As long as on either end, there's, say, an olive tree. It doesn't matter. There can be a cassia tree. There can be maple trees. There can be olive trees in between. Or it could all be olive trees. That's fine. Whatever you want to do. You get bonus points if the the run is at least four cards and they're all the same tree right so say four olive trees right. or so yeah that's like, that's two points a card instead of one so right it's pretty good to get yeah because there's not a the, the scores are you know in the teens right maybe yeah, um, maybe you also get bonus points uh if you've played the one and or the eight in your tableau dirt for that run if those are the bookend or yep. one of those are the bookends you get one point for the one two points for the eight but notice earlier I said that you may potentially score a species of tree. And the reason that is, in order to score that species of tree, you must have equal to or more than the, the number of pit value. The, the face the, value the, of the card. Right. In your hand at the end of the game. So going back to that olive tree example, mm-hmm. uh, I have to have the highest or tied for the highest value of olive trees in my hand at the end of the game. 
So I have this great run, whatever, but you have the seven olive tree in your hand, Tony, and I only have the five, or maybe I have, say, the two and the four in my hand for a total of six. Sure. Seven's higher than five or six, whichever I have. Ergo, I can't score olive trees. You can. And if we had tied, then we both could score those. Or, or everybody who has olives would be able to would be able to score them. The one catch to that, or the one additional catch to that, I should say, is the one in the eight. So eight is the highest card in the in a yep. certain species. Eight is bigger than one. Right. However, if you have the eight and I have the one, then your eight gets trumped by my one. However, if you had the two and I had the one, your two is higher than one. Right. So you would be able to score it. So basically, it, it all boils down to the one trumps the eight, and that's it. Otherwise, the one is just the weakest card. And that, that causes some interesting decisions in what you keep, what you play in your Arboretum, what you mm -hmm. throw to the other players, too, because... Until a, a one or an eight makes its appearance, you just don't know what the hell's going on. Yep, and and it, you're at risk. And, you know, during the game, you feel like a little bit of tension about your discards. Oh, more than a little bit, I'd say. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so another thing, and is the artwork is gorgeous in this game. The the trees, uh, each individual tree has uh, has their own artwork, or I should say, each species of tree has its own artwork. And they're gorgeous. Uh, really pretty. Yeah. It, for fifteen bucks, really good it, it, filler done right. I would say absolutely. This is uh, this is definitely one that uh, everybody that likes a thinky filler should get. I I would concur. And normally I would go on and talk about the things that I didn't dig about the game. But I'll be honest, I can't really think of anything. It doesn't overstay its welcome. It works your brain over either as a warm up mm -hmm. or cool down, mm -hmm. you know, for or in between games or whatever. Perfect for that. It's fairly priced, gorgeous artwork. I got nothing. Do you have anything that's the only thing I've ever had a problem with and it's probably me teaching sometimes to some people mm -hmm. but the one in eight and i have to have more than up here down in my arbor some people haven't grok the scoring until we actually do a scoring round and they go oh i got screwed i understand now well the good news though is with it being a you know 15 20 minute game okay if you didn't get it the first time here yeah. let's shuffle up and deal and that's what we did and play another we played again play another round right um, as far as a rating, we rate on a 1 to 6 scale, mm -hmm. with 1 being lighted on fire, 6 being a Hall of Fame game. For what this is, going up against other fillers, sure, I would rate this as a 5. Oh, I concur. Um, it does what it's intended to do perfectly. Thinky filler, well done. Yep. Yeah? Yes. All right. So that's our burrito. All right, so Heavy Cardboard's turn to take on 20th Century. 20th Century is a 2010 release designed by Vladimir Suchi. Or, or Vladimir Suchi for, That's for right. us regular folk. He's the famous designer of Shipyard, a, right. a 2009 release, mm -hmm. a game where we think very highly of. And 20th Century is a three to five player game. It takes about a couple of hours, a little less if you got fewer players. Mm -hmm. And what's going on in the game is it's a six turn game and you're building a country over the course of those six turns. And to build a country, you're gonna buy some land tiles at an auction. God knows we love auctions. Yeah, boy, do we. we. Yes. So there'll be a number of land tiles up for auction. When you acquire a land tile, you will also get a trash cube. And you will get additional trash cubes for each land tile you acquire at an auction. So if I acquire two land tiles, I would get one for the first one, two for the second one, three for the third one, etc. So more tiles you get, which is good, the more trash you get, which is bad. bad. Right. You can also um, acquire technology tiles. And it's kind of the way to acquire technology tiles is really kind of like a sort of like a Dutch auction where the price starts high and goes low. Okay. Because as land tiles are sold, the price of technology tiles will drop. So you as a player have a choice now of do I want to bid on this land tile and possibly buy it, or do I want to drop out of the auction for land tiles and now acquire a technology tile at its current price? So the sooner I do that, 
I might be paying higher than people who drop out later. But you have more of a choice. I you get, get first, first pick dibs, or right, second right, pick, right, 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 of the, right? Of the tiles that are over there. So a little bit of a balancing mechanism there. Um, land tiles are bought with money. Technology tiles are bought with science points. And when you buy the land tiles, they have cities. And when a city is populated with citizens, mm -hmm. it'll produce something. They'll either produce money, science points, victory points. It, maybe it's a recycling center to take, a take care of trash cubes. Some cities produce more than one thing. And as the game goes through the six turns, the land tiles get cooler and cooler and make more stuff. So they build up, right, yeah. right. And same for the technology tiles, A too. narrative arc, if you will. Indeed, sir. So, like, phase one of each turn is the land tiles. And phase two is kind of the people getting their technology tiles as they drop out of the land auction. And then the third phase is this another type of auction to avoid... Ecological That's catastrophe. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember this now. And it's it's um, it's a cool auction. It's one where there's there's one track for each player, and you pay in technology points. So you better keep your technology points up, and it's numbered like say one through twenty. So if I want to bid eleven, I'll put my pawn on the eleven spot, right? Now somebody could outbid me at twelve, and I have to move someone out somewhere else. Maybe outbid somebody right, else. Right, because you're only allowed. You can only have one one pawn per column. Per column. Yeah. And so it's it's some are worse than others or right. better than or but less bad if there's five players there's five columns in play right once we're all in our own column we're going to pay the price in technology points that we've bid but each of the columns is progressively more severe of a catastrophe there, yeah there you go that that that's what i was trying to and say the first right. column's always like no catastrophe so everyone's just bidding like mad dogs on that one and at some point people are dropping out and they have to so one tactic is I'm oh, I'm a bit up here I'm a bit up here knowing that you're gonna outbid me and pay 15 technology points all right fine I'll I'll just come down here and and take two trash cubes for two technology points unless you then went into another column that had somebody already <laughs> yeah. there which then kicks them out and they they could conceivably go back to the one you just came from oh yeah or to any yeah. other one. And it kind of has that cascade effect. When people have a lot of science points, it that cascade effect, it, it's just brutal and going back and forth until people finally go, uh, price is too high. And tap it out. Just right. go where they're... Where, <laughs> I'll, I'll take the worst catastrophe yeah. and pay little to no uh, That's technology. Right. That's right. Very, very cool mechanic. Uh, indeed it is. Um, I, I like everything about the game. And... Uh, it could be maybe a little fiddly for some as you're moving citizens around because some of the technology tiles are trains that let you move your people right, around right. and the trash cubes all over the place and stuff like that. I don't mind it. It's it's not that fiddly to me, but to some perhaps it is. But that's really about the only thing I can think negative about the game. I mean, it's got three freaking auctions in there, right? One for money. One, the Dutch auction for technology kind of thing where you, you when do I drop out mm -hmm. and then the catastrophe auction so it's just you know it's right up my alley so I have a question for you sure. so uh, when when I knew this was going to be your your trailer for today mm -hmm. um, I got to reading other people's takes on it and stuff and somebody uh, had mentioned that it's almost like Carcassonne meets Power Grid what do you think? Now, you've played this more than I have. I've only sure. played it the one time so mm -hmm. far. Really enjoyed my play of it. But I thought, okay, because the Carcassonne tiles, right? You yeah. know, you get I can kind see of that. that part. And then the auctions, um, you know, kind of a, you know, a map type thing with power grid plus the auctions. And I can yeah. see it. But what do you think? No, I think the power grid parts are reach. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I just I thought that was interesting. The Carcassonne part, I guess, is there because you, but you don't have to fit tiles together. You can just fit them anyway. If the train train tracks don't connect, no problem. You just won't be able to move peeps along that. Ah, uh, I got gotcha. you. Okay, yeah, so. all right. Anyway, um, I think uh, I'm going to give the game a rating on our okay. one to six scale of a uh, of an awesome solid four. Okay, which is above average. Something that if you didn't already own, you would consider. Going yes. out and buying, not necessarily, but right. you're it, it, possible. And if you're an auction guy and you like a tableau builder, yeah, go get it. Yeah, I, like I said, I've only played it once. I really enjoyed my play. There's a reason that you put it in one of our uh, three challenge games. Indeed. Um, so we're definitely going to be playing this in the upcoming weeks. I'm looking forward to it. That's 20th Century. All right, Edward. Sir. I understand you're going to lead us on a discussion of ground floor. Yeah, let's roll into it. So, ground floor, 
published in 2012, designed by David Short. Uh, the artist is Ariel Sione, I think is how you pronounce it. I apologize if not. Uh, published by Tasty Menstrual Games, mm -hmm. uh, originally on Kickstarter. Uh, plays two to six players, and the, the published playtime is 90 to 150 minutes. As far as availability and cost, I've seen it as cheap as maybe 20, 25 bucks set used uh, secondhand on okay. BGG Marketplace. Okay. Um, but online, I've seen it for going about 40, 45 bucks online. Okay. And I'm noticing though lately that a lot of places are out of stock. I don't know about Tasty Minstrel's site directly. Okay. Um, it, there, it may be available, but there, there, it can be found. I know it's on Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. Sure, sure. As far as plays and player counts that, that I have experienced, um, I've played it three, four, five, and six, and I've played it now nine or ten times. Um, and I'll be honest, I've enjoyed it across all those player counts. How about you? Uh, I played once five player, but it was eons ago, and I can't even count that. I have played three player twice and six player once. Okay, cool. Um, so sadly, uh, rolling into kind of scalability here, Sadly, I haven't played it two player, and I I kind of I feel bad because David Short a year and a half ago or so asked if I'd write a review what? of the game, and I said, well, I want to play it two player first, so I haven't written hmm. that review because I haven't played it two player. So I apologize, David, but hopefully this makes up for it. Oh, well, David, don't take this the wrong way. I'm I'm not sure I want to play this two player. I think it's better at the higher end yeah. of things. Um, I think it plays similarly. Across all player counts, there's more competition uh, yes. in the game for spots with more players. So I, w you and I, I think, see that as a positive with more competition. Uh, I kind of think a three-player is even kind of a training game. Uh, I I didn't mind it three. It's it's not well, I didn't as mind tight. it three. Right, it's but, not right. But because it's not as tight. Sure. Well, that kind of leads into the fact that at the Conclave recently, right. a couple weeks ago... We played at six, and I gotta be honest, I was really cringing at the idea because a lot of times in games yeah. you'll see, oh, it plays two to five hundred, or you know, you, right. it'll it'll play two to six up and to eight the, players, right? And you would never consider playing it at the higher end. A, a good example of that is something like Caverna. I have no interest playing that game six players. The amount of downtime would or just seven. be, oh, it plays seven. Yeah. Oh God. It's even worse. So I kind of had that initial like, uh, going into our play with six players. Mm -hmm. But I got to be honest, man. I was blown away at how well and how smooth and how, I guess, relatively yeah. short of a playtime it played in. And I would not hesitate to play it six players again. When you consider that four of those players were essentially noobs, you know, Paul Chad had played before, but... His play had been a long time ago, too, so he had to be retaught. And the other guys were noobs. Given that consideration, mm -hmm. and everyone got what was being taught to them, they minded their AP. No one really AP'd. Mm -hmm. And we banged that thing out, and it was awesomely competitive and a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I guess I should throw in a caveat that with me having played it as many times as I had, I was able to kind of keep the game moving mm -hmm. and not be a cattle prod to people, you know, and, yeah, yeah. and rush people, but made sure that nobody suffered from excessive AP. You do know and, it's your turn, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I really, I got nothing. I, I am, I was blown away and very pleasantly surprised at how well it played six players, yeah. both in lack of downtime, keeping things moving, and how short of a play time. Yep. Relatively Relative speaking, that, that it was. Yep. So, uh, yeah, definitely uh, from three to six, can definitely recommend it, I think. Indeed. So Ground Floor is a business-themed worker placement game where the overall goal is to develop your business and expand and upgrade your corporate headquarters. Players do this by upgrading their existing offices in their corporate headquarters building, as well as growing upward, quite literally, by adding new floors to your building. Throughout the game, players will take actions such as hiring new employees, which garner them more time markers, which are essentially the workers that they use to gain those resources, the, the money and information in the game. Mm -hmm. 
Players then take those resources and turn those into new floors and building upgrades and tenant improvements that will provide the victory points that they need to win the game. The game takes place over a series of up to nine rounds, with each round broken up into five phases. Receive income, hire employees, schedule business, and conduct business, which those two are kind of the meat of the game. And then finally, there's a, a cleanup phase or a reorganize right. phase of the game. The game ends, like I said, either at the end of the ninth round or at the end of the round where any player builds their sixth or more floor. And that's pretty much uh, that's it in a nutshell. So let's talk components and graphic design before we get into the meat of this. Let's, okay. Let's start there. Your thoughts on the components specifically? Love them. I, th I think they're very good. All the chits are nice and thick. Everything is very well produced. Well, the the box itself is <laughs> yeah. bulletproof. I think that's like I, four millimeter thick cardboard. Yeah, or it's something. it's ridiculous it, yeah. how how thick and sturdy the the actual <sighs> box itself is. It way it's that's a heavy it's, game. It's it's heavy cardboard literally. Yes. Um, the 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 board itself is has a real nice finish to it. Mm -hmm. um, it really thick uh, player boards. The the chits or I guess the money and the information in the game right. are thick cardboard. Yeah, yeah. All the time markers and yeah. the the goods are all wooden cubes or wooden discs. The CEOs are little resin pieces. Yes. Uh, which I got to be honest, the the bottom side they don't always sit flat because there's little nubs or here and there. Purple guy looks like he had a little too much to drink. He kind of wobbles. <laughs> you file and, that down. Yeah, exactly. You file a little sandpaper, or whatever sits flush. No, no worries. So I got to be honest, I was really happy with the uh, with the component quality on this. Um, as far as the graphic design, I think it's pretty clear. Uh, the player boards have almost like a player aid yeah. uh, printed on it. It's a, a step by step right. of uh, of all the phases of the game yep. and what takes place. Um, so I think that was that was smart placement yeah. uh, by Tasty Minstrel to yeah, put indeed. that there. There's also a player aid which shows all the uh, floors, floors and the tenant improvements and all the bonuses mm -hmm. that those give. Um, so that that's useful as well. Um, I kind of have a, a, a bit of a gripe, though. Uh, as I got far, one too. <laughs> as far as component or uh, graphic design is, which floor is it? Like it, the game's called ground floor, so your tableau, your actual player board yeah. is floor one. Yeah. And so, being able to figure out, okay, is this my second or third floor or fourth floor right. that I'm building? How do you count that? The first tile I place is my second floor. It's right. kind of weird. Right, and so that's a little less than clear, necessary, you know, kind of. And we and we're saying that because we've seen that in the games. Right. Oh yeah, it's not clear to people all the times. Even a guy who's played it as much as I have, I still struggle with that. Unless I recently played the game, and you know, it's fresh sure. in my head. Sure. Um, the Kickstarter, uh, one of the stretch goals, I believe it was, mm -hmm. was this kind of almost like a ruler type yeah. thing, to where it showed. Uh, which floor? Right, you just lay it right down by your tableau, and it shows. Oh, this is your second. This is your third, etc. Right. Which that was fantastic. That was great, but I feel like that should have been kind of in the base game. Yeah, you you, know? you can get it at the BGG Geek Store. If Tasty Mitchell makes another copy of the game, another uh, reprint of the game, I hope that's included. Right. Yeah, it shouldn't be kind of an add-on type thing. Um, but other than that, the only other graphic design. Well, I got one. Oh, go for it. Go ahead. The info chits and the money chits are pretty small yeah okay that's fair that, yeah i just don't know. <laughs> how'd that go it's like two cube size you know yeah they they, they are small yeah and when yeah. you have big clod hoppers yeah i, I get <laughs> right. that um so i ha i have one other little thing and the only real explanations that i've needed to do after teaching the game mm -hmm. is in the advertising agency um where players get bonus yeah. time markers added there or if they don't the three different ones right and so it's i think it i think it's clear but it can be a little confusing until you learn it until it kind of yeah. oh okay i get it i go here so i get a bonus one the other one is just showing that you get one time marker the one that right. was there you get right. you don't get any bonuses but other than that i would say overall well done on the graphic design as well totally what what do you think about the uh, rule book and its clarity and quality? Because I've never 
I don't own a copy currently, and right. I, I've never even seen the rule book. Really? Yeah. Never. Never. Wow. You okay. taught the game every you know every time I've seen it. Yeah, I guess I guess there's been no need provided you right. trust me that I that I taught it right. Wait a minute. Um, how so, many did you lose? <laughs> the the rule book's really easy and well laid out. Uh, there are right. tons of pictures. There's little post-it notes, like, you know, they're printed on there, but they look like post-it notes for little reminders of okay. things and stuff. That's kind of um, clever. Yeah, it, it, it is. Yeah. There are plenty of examples, and there's a really, really good example in the in the rule book for the advertising agency and the way to resolve that, because it can get really, really uh, crowded mm -hmm. when you're playing five and six players, and it can be a little confusing do I do it on popularity order here, here, and here, or do I do it in a certain order? And the the example was was perfect. Cleared up any questions that uh, players may have on that. I'll be honest. I I think maybe once or twice throughout all my plays, I've had to reference uh, rules questions on on BGG. Um, so the fact that I haven't needed to do that often tells me that the rule book has done a good job it's explaining well, yeah. everything. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'd give it high marks for, as far as rule books go. Awesome. So this is the part of the review where we talk about what makes the game medium or heavy. Which in this case, I feel like it's a, a, touch, a step up from medium, but it's, it's definitely not heavy. So maybe somewhere in between, I think is fair. Yeah, I think uh, a medium heavy is um, in that realm. Yeah. yeah. So we break it down. We have five criteria, mm -hmm. five different things that we discuss. First one's complexity. Second, planning. Third, luck and random factors. Game length and getting it. Yes. Like how long it takes to get the game. So let's start off in complexity. Okay. I don't think the the rules are that hard to grok. Um, as far as rules overhead, I I think that's pretty low in this game. I think it's it's pretty uh, pretty easy as far as rules go. Yeah, I, I, the only thing we've seen, we already alluded to it, trip people up in terms of rules complexity is the rules around how much additional cost of money and information it costs for each floor because there's a base cost and an incremental cost and, and until you've screwed that up, sometimes people don't get that right, right up. And that is a little complex and the ruler helps with that, mm -hmm. but I think that's really about the only thing Complexity-wise, I've seen people have problems with. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, I feel like the game flows in a in a logical manner, and it's mm -hmm. very procedural. Mm -hmm. Like you're gonna do if if the game for every round or if, yeah for every round in the game, you're going to follow the exact same steps in the exact same order. And uh, with it being a worker placement, all the buildings, buildings. if you will, all, all the different things are going to resolve in the same order right. every turn. And so that I think that helps make it a little bit easier to learn sure. and to understand sure. as far as that goes. Um, there are five choices of things to do on the main board, and then there's six on your own player board. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a lot of options. I mean, you're looking at, at any given time, a minimum of 11 options and as you add floors and you add tenant improvements mm -hmm. and upgrades those are going to give you even more options so players can get maybe a little lost i guess and overwhelmed with a with a plethora where, where do i of, where do i choices. put a worker right what, what do i do and not only that but when do i do it you know what i mean so i feel like there's some depth uh, as far as the decision making, there's okay. depth of complexity there, or I should say, it gets most of its complexity from the decision tree, not the rules overhead, is what. I, yeah, a long way uh, yeah. to say. So it. let's yeah. roll into planning. Planning. So this is the meat of the game. I mean, this is this is the entire game almost. I would say okay. as for, uh, the ultimate goal is to score victory points. Right. And each player has to figure out. The best way to go about doing that just like i mean most euros sure. are going to be like that but there's a lot of different paths to take we're all going to end up in the same place we're all fighting hopefully well we're all fighting to build floors mm -hmm. in the end that's what you're trying to do because floors equal victory points right but how you go about getting your money and your information mm -hmm. might be a little bit different than the way i do it different than the way you know Dave does it, et cetera, et cetera, right. and and just oodles of choices and paths in which to to take to plan for. Right. See, I I think of the planning in this game as more of an exercise in budgeting. 
than planning because the two currencies, time, or excuse me, information and money, have to be budgeted because every action you take out there is going to cost either money or it's going to cost info or a little both. Right. And so how do I budget what I have versus what's coming in in my income phase mm -hmm. and what am I earning through this turn so that I can spend the four money and four info to just put a worker in the construction yard so that I can then spend more money and more info to build a floor. I got you. No, that actually I could. I, I plan it on a budget basis. Huh. Interesting. I, I I like the way that makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot. You got anything else as far as planning goes? Uh, the fact that I think of it as a as a budgeting exercise is probably uh, surprising my wife right now. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't think I know how to budget. <laughs> That's funny. I, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because Amanda is probably going to be thinking the same thing. Or, or, or maybe she's like, oh, maybe that's why he doesn't think that's of right. it that way. Because, yeah, that's funny. So let's roll into luck and random factors. Let's do that. All right. So I would argue that this has a little bit more randomness in it than our typical wheelhouse type game. So... Uh, processing okay all right so first off we don't share notes so yeah 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 so first off we have the initial turn order every game's got mm. some kind of randomness yeah. as far as that goes heck often a given even 18xx has that right mm. but then there's the economic forecast cards okay and those are going to do two there those are going to impart two different types of randomness in there limited randomness i should say the first thing is it's going to control the job market right. as far as how many uh, if, workers and how expensive are they right. going to be to if hire? If it's a depression, it's going to be cheaper to hire workers and there'll be more workers available. Right, because they're out of work. If it's a boom, well, there's fewer workers and they cost more to hire. Right, right. no, and, and that makes and, sense. Right, and and you're saying that's random because of the, the way the deck is structured. Sure, well, well and within... Even though, uh, let's say we're in a stable economy, mm -hmm. just because you know these two cards, this the current one and the future one, mm -hmm. it says stable. There's still a range within that yes. that it could be, you know, <clears throat> two to four, say right. for instance. Right. And along with that, not only does it control the job market, but it also dictates how many customers are going to buy from the retail outlets. Right. Again, those Another are going to have the same range. Right. But. Though that one thing is going to impact or impart two different types of randomness, controlled randomness, or yeah, well, limited randomness, I think is the right way to put it. Well, you know, I think what you're saying is because you see the card says boom, uh -huh. and you know the range. Because that's on your player board, it, it, it yeah. shows that, right? And you know it's a higher range, too, as opposed to the, the range for like a depression might be zero to one right. versus two to four or something. Mm -hmm. So. Even the ranges are different, but you still get to you see what's coming. You don't know the exact value of the two to four. It might be a three, might be a two, might be a four, but you know there's two to four coming up. Right. I'm, I'm, my point is is that one thing has multiple randomness yeah. to it. it, it, it I a, am I conveying that? Is yeah, that making I, sense? I'm just like going back to what you what you originally said about it, more randomness than games that we normally play mm -hmm. or, or right. like in a game and stuff. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and disagree with that because I think this is this random it's it's akin I think to the random of the uh, demand tiles and automobile. Right? You know the range. You know what's gonna be it's gonna fall in there somewhere. It's not really all that random. It's not like okay here's this card. Oh crap. Alright that's fair. No it's no, not I'll, it's not bad it's that. not bad random. And right. You know how I feel about, sure, about sure. random. <laughs> well, and there, random. and there is kind of, and I don't know if I would call this randomness because it is player controlled, but it's not necessarily your player control. And what I mean by that is there's two different ways that the game can end. The game could conceivably go all nine rounds right. and then whoever has the most points wins. That's it. Or... If a player will end it, or possibly multiple players could trigger the end, on the as same long round right of the fours um, by building their sixth or more floor, right. and so I don't know if that's necessarily a random factor in it. It's it's more of a player driven, you know, timer kind of variability. Right. 
Yeah, I don't. I, don't, I agree. I don't think that's a random considered okay. a random. Okay, but it, it's definitely a variable that you need to consider while you're playing. Right. This this game may or may not go nine rounds. Guess what? It's not. Probably. Yeah, I, I'll be honest. I've never played a game yet. That's gone the full nine rounds. Yeah. I've pl- I played some that I fought in May, but it ended in the eighth round. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so more often than not, it's going to end by uh, a player or players triggering the right. end of the game early. Right. So moving on into game length. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know that the game, w- the, the, the length adds much to the weight. Now, with a caveat for if anyone out there uh, who's new is listening, for us... An hour and a half to two and a half hour game is a standard game. I don't feel like yeah. that's at, that anything that's a, in that range. That's a short game. <laughs> well, <laughs> right. well, my point is, it's not going to add that that range. There is not going to contribute no. to the weight of the game. I don't feel like for us, right? So, with that in mind, I don't feel like this the the game length contributes to that at all. Uh, yeah, I've heard some, read some, you know, horror stories from people on BGG about, oh my God, with three players, it took four hours, and you you're, know, you're doing it wrong. Yeah, you're APing everything, <laughs> or or you're just you've got something wrong, or or you're not planning out the majority of your turn, right. or at least you know contingency plans when it's not your turn. You should be fully engaged. You should where be. that shouldn't be that shouldn't be happening. Right, right? And, there, and there is enough cooking to engage you. Right, and I. Let me ask you: Do you feel like the game plays? Does it run long? Does it does it feel right for what it is, or or, yep. or what? I feel I feel that it has a, a appropriate length. Yeah, I I, I do too. Um, and it moves surprisingly well. Uh, and we we harped on this earlier right. about the the player count. Like even with mm-hmm. six players, as long as people are moving it along, it's it's humming pretty well. Well, maybe the Extended length for some is all about getting it. How long do you think it takes a new person to get it? I think after only a couple of rounds, it should start to click. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the mechanics of placing your time workers, for sure, real sure. quick. And, and and seeing how, uh, how expensive it is to build the floors. Because yeah. to be able to go to the construction company area, um, you need four information and for money, or as we call it, four and four, because mm-hmm. you know, right, right. Um, so that's just to place your time marker mm-hmm. there in the location to say, "Hey, I am putting myself, making it available that so I can buy something. I'm going to pick something, right? Either a floor or a tenant improvement. Right. And then, if it's your first floor, it's four and four more, right? So the first floor, check that. The second floor, the first built floor, uh, costs eight and eight total. It costs four and four mm-hmm. to place it mm-hmm. during the schedule business. Kind of the a lot like in Dominant Species, how you're placing out all your time markers going around the the, the and table and everything, resolution, right? and then resolve it. Um, but then you have time to get the extra time and the extra inform, or I'm sorry, the extra information and the extra money to be able to pay right. for those extra Cause floors. Because that resolves last the building of the of the floors and the TI. So, as the different areas resolve, you could acquire, then, acquire the things, acquire what you right. need to build right. those things. So you you know you're taking a bit of a exposure there. Right. So to circle back, I feel like. You it may take a couple turns or a couple rounds mm-hmm. to be able to see how that works and everything, um, but I would say that it may take an entire game to see kind of the way the game flows and how that flow changes uh, as to what actions are more important at different times in the game. So you you you're, you're looking at me like uh, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I just don't think the. The flow changes. Well, okay. Let 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 me let me. I think the throw game this is at you. Linear. See, and I disagree. The reason is, say the networking uh, area, right? The advertising. Yeah, the advertising. Right? I'm sorry. Advertising Thank you. and the broadcast here. Right. So in advertising, that's going to dictate turn order mm-hmm. and the resolution for the rest of that turn and going into the next turn, right. next round, right. right? Early on. That very early on, and I'd say through the mid game, it's going to be fairly contested. Late game, I feel like it kind of 
the game gets away from that at times. Wow. And focuses more on other areas to where when there's a big rush on building floors, uh, because, again, that's the trigger for the end of the game. Yeah, I don't see that at all. Just I think that advertising specifically, the only time it becomes less important to me is if I acquire the, the tenant improvement that prevents my popularity from, from dropping. Right, from regressing. Right. Because... Otherwise, you're always needing to invest something in the advertising to keep your popularity up because popularity is turn order. And that's pretty important on a lot of things like building floors. I want my choice. I'll get this and then you can pick. You know, and the bonuses and for selling goods at the retail stores. So for me, the only time, and I like that tenant improvement. Can yeah, you, t right, can you sure. tell I get right. it like every time? Right. That's when advertising wanes for me is when I've got my popularity up so high that I'm really not, just not worried about it. I don't have to go there as much. I, so, so okay, but you're always needing to keep your popularity up. Otherwise, I don't see. I I feel like the flow of the game changes based on player needs. So maybe not as a whole for player. Or for, well, game does not. Well, sure, but seeing the way that it flows. And the way it changes, I, I do feel like the game change. Maybe I'm doing a terrible job of conveying this, yeah. but I, I just think that it just there's an evolution in the way. Even though it's procedural and everything resolves in the same order, there's emphasis is put in different areas at different times in the game, and it take it may take a player the whole game to yeah. to see those that kind of wavelength. I, the, I, only, I, the only time I see that, mm -hmm. um, like retail market, the, you know, when you're selling your cubes to mm -hmm. to the demand, mm -hmm. I'll see that wane and wax based on the economy. If if the game is going to say I'm going to buy five of them suckers, everybody's putting their cubes out there okay. to get sold. But if it's depression, there's one or two. It's like eh, people are backed off unless they want to gamble a little bit, right? So I guess yeah, if there uh, is okay. if there is an ebb and flow or, or or a fluctuation in the in the pursuit of certain actions, mm -hmm. I think it's going to be economy driven. Okay, maybe that's my that's my take. We'll we'll agree to disagree. Good on talk that, either way. Yeah, that's Good fine. Good talk. Right. <laughs> so what makes the game fun? Like, why are people going to want to play this game? Well, uh, first thing on my list is. There's two currencies involved in the game, the money and the info we've talked about. And those are the same currencies that are in business. There's money and there's information, okay. right? There's sure. knowledge I... and there's cash flow. Right. And unless you're Apple, <laughs> both of those things are in tight supply. And you really need to balance your acquisition and your spending, hence the budgeting, of both of those currencies to... Not get hosed. Yeah, because you're going to find in the game, at sometimes you're going to be flush with cash and information poor and, and that, vice versa. And that's a bad thing. Right. Because, well, Yeah, it, because you, you want to maintain a balance because you, a lot of times, in most things, it's going to require both. Yeah. Um, and every action costs something to take. Well, except for your personal ones on your tableau. Sure, that just uses time. Yeah. Um, first thing that I want to point out is it's aesthetically pleasing that you just see your building physically grow <laughs> yeah. so you have your tableau out here and you're laying out uh you're laying out floors right and so it's building it's drawn in 3d but it's only in t 2d, 2D it's yeah. not like legos which would have been cool yeah huh. anyway but it's still aesthetically pleasing to actually see what you're building plus those floors are giving you kind of rule breakers yeah. or special power up type things it that tableau where you're building those floors, you have like a little uh, floor plan of six rooms that's you, in your business, and and they all do wonderful things for you. But you can acquire better versions of those rooms and right. put those on there too. So that's just another cool way you can see that grow. Well, on that same note, there's really interesting decisions to be made between the. I'm, I kind of want to say more marginal benefits here on your player board. Yeah. So you spend time in, okay, maybe it's not the strongest move out there, but it's not contested because it's on my tableau. It's my office, right? right? Or you, you kind of have to decide and juggle between doing that and going out there into the world, so to speak, 
and fighting with everybody for the better the better benefits. Right. And you have to figure out which is more important at what time right. and and the timing of doing that. The timing because sometimes you can play on your own tableau as like a stall. Yes. And see what other people are doing. But that comes with a cost because like in our, our worker placement discussion, we talked about when you place your, your time markers, your workers in this game, everything costs, but it's incrementally more. So if you're the first one to that spot, it might have cost you one money and one time, or one mm-hmm. info, rather. Right. The next guy is going to pay two money and two info. The next guy, three and three. Or, so so you're, you're stalling with a bit of a... Of a uh, Risk of, right. of increase. Right. And if it doesn't cost more, then there's a a uh, a loss of choice, maybe. Right. To where, you know, the, yeah. the, the order in which, okay, I was there first, I get first dibs on something. Right. Um, whereas it may have cost you the same thing to go to be in there right. as well, but you, you're, you right. know, you're, you're getting last licks. Right. There's, there is some sort of cost involved. Right. So the consulting firm. Um, <laughs> yeah. It rewards players who correctly rele- or read other players' positions in regards to information. So, let me explain what the consulting firm is. So, that's going to be, for most players, the main way they're going to get information. And how that works is you take one of your time markers off your player board and put it out there. And it's a decreasing amount of money that it actually costs. I believe it starts with either 5 or $6, and then it's $1 less to go there the second time or for the next player, so on and so forth. But going there, when to schedule, uh, when you schedule business, you place your marker there, you pay that amount of money. Right. During the conduct business, it just slides over. Nothing else happens. That's it. The following turn... When players place out there and they pay to to put onto those right. spots, if someone has backed up, so you have a marker out there. If someone has backed you up out there, then they will push you out, and that's how you get your ten information. Right. And so, I love that you kind of have to judge whether or not you can afford to go say fifth down on that track, because you have to think, okay, I went fifth here. Somebody's going to have to go fifth or, you know, right. place five markers out there total to be able to get that extra, that 10 information. And it's a, it's a, it's a fine, uh, gamble or an, it, it an is educated a gamble, gamble yeah. on that. Unlike the other spots where placement is usually more expensive, placement in the uh, consulting firm is cheaper, but the risk is higher. Right. Because it, you pay less money, but you're taking that risk that no one's going to back you up. Right. Because if no one backs you up, you know what you don't get? You're out the money and you don't get your that's information. Right. And I think that's very thematic with consulting companies because they're a risk. Very cool. Yeah, it, it does make <laughs> you know? sense. I, I, yeah. So speaking of thematic, I, in my head, I think that 90% of the games, in, of Euro games, are pasted on theme. And I don't give a crap about theme. This one I feel is thematic. I really feel like I'm, I'm running a business and making decisions about getting my money, my income, and my information income so I can spend them to boop, 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 put floors on my building, which is not just victory points, but they help me in my efforts. Right. There's special abilities right. or, or better, right. and I, more efficient. This is one of the games where I actually feel a theme. Yeah. I, I, I think the, the business theme comes through. Yeah. I agree. Um so the factory spaces, speaking, kind of going back to what I was saying mm-hmm. uh, a minute ago about gambling, right? Yeah. Those are calculated gambles as well. Uh-huh. And the reason is, uh, instead of it being fully relatable to other players, the variable, the variability, boy, I'm having a hard time talking today. The variability What's of in the, that Coke? Don't worry about it. Uh, of the economic forecast plays a really big part because we, we talked about... Um, that's going to dictate how many customers are going to buy at the retail outlets. So even though the economy, let's say you're in a depression and maybe there's only zero to two goods that are going to be bought, you still may see players go over there more than two players for a couple of reasons. One, it might be a gamble to try and get an extra six or eight dollars 
um, if they happen to be higher in turn order mm -hmm. so that they're able to sell their right. goods. Higher in popularity, that's the turn order. Right. Or, and this I think is pretty cool, that let's say you're a dollar or two short for being able to do whatever it is you're trying to do, say to build, buy an, uh, to build another floor. Right. You could spend two money. I think it's two money, two information, and one good, one good. to be able to go to the retail out or to go to the factory mm -hmm. and then to be able to place it out and potentially into the market. Right. Sell your goods at the retail outlets. Well, if you're a dollar or two short, it might make sense to take that gamble because you're thinking, if it doesn't sell, I can always liquidate it for a few bucks, and that gives me that extra dollar that, extra that dollar. I was short. You know, yes, it, was it efficient? No, it was terrible because no. you used the good and you used a couple of information. Well, but it's if you're desperate, yeah, it, there's an option, and it's and there's always that that chance for a windfall that yeah. you actually sell your good for way more money than you ever expected. Rock on, you yeah. know. In so many benefit. of our games that we play, we, how often do we say, "Oh, I'm a dollar short"? Sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. As inefficient as that is, that's that dollar. Right. <laughs> right. You can get it. <laughs> so another thing here, the time markers, right? So when you hire employees, because you start out as the CEO of your company, well, right. you can, you stay you're the CEO of right. your company, but you're the only employee. You There's are the one. You. And you start out with four time markers, which are essentially your your or time markers, which are your workers. Right. In a worker placement sense. Right, but not as employees. They're, right. right. As you hire new employees, for each time that you hire a new employee, you do have to take time markers to train them, yeah. which again, thematic, because you have to train your employees. Yeah. Um, that gives you three more time markers to be able to use. So for every employee, you have to pay more money. And by pay, I mean you get less income each round. Right. Because you're having to, you don't get to keep it all now. Salaries. Now you have to, right. But you get more time markers. And this kind of goes all the way back to what you were talking about stalling. We all may have different amounts of employees. You may have four, including the CEO. Mm -hmm. I may have two. Mm -hmm. Somebody else might have two, might have three, three, whatever. So we all have different amounts of time markers. And some of the actions that we take, whether it's on our, or especially on our tableau, some cost multiple time markers to be able to go there. Right. So there's one floor that allows you to take four time markers and place it there, and you get to go out to the construction company without paying the four and four, the four money and the, and the four, four, four information. Right. And so it's it's kind of a, which is more important? Is it time markers or is it money and information? But it allows you, if you have yeah. more time markers, you can spend them one at a time on something that only takes one on your tableau mm -hmm. to be able to stall to hope that somebody backs you up and you can yeah. always wait and be like, okay, I got this $4 yeah. in reserve in case somebody doesn't back me up, but I'm hoping they will. Oh, wait. Thanks, Dave. He right. did back me up. Now I have these time markers. I've only got I... two left. Somebody please back me up. You're saying this in your head before I have to do it myself. Right. As a last resort, I will go there to make sure right. that I get the information. Oh, thank God. Right. Yeah. But now I don't have to. But you don't to. say that. No, you play it totally cool. Yeah, poker, poker face. face. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I really love that stalling effect that can yeah. that, that you can do, and it's it's almost a game of chicken, but only if the players realize what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. But if they see your third down on that consulting firm, and only one has been backed up, and there's two more. Yeah. People are going to know you're going to stall and we're just going to wait and try and wait you out and force you to spend that money that you didn't want to spend. It, it can get mean over there. It's rough. Oh, yeah. it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that right there is one of my very favorite things yeah. about this game. Um, one one thing that I like about the game is I'm I'm never bored playing ground floor. Regardless of how many people are playing, there's plenty for me to keep track of, of the other players and think about, okay, in my budgeting, I need to do this, this, and this. What's going on? You just went there. Crap, that's going to cost me two more dollars. Yes, I can afford that. I'm also going to have to go. I, I'm never, there's no downtime in my head when I'm playing ground floor. Yeah, there shouldn't be. No. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I I totally agree. Right on. Ground floor, like 
many, many games. There's some things we maybe don't like quite so much. Yeah, I, I mean, no game's perfect, right? No game's perfect. Maybe our burrito? Couldn't find a fault on that. Anyway, moving on. We harped on this earlier. Maybe not harp, but we, we mentioned it earlier. The keeping track of the floors. And, right. okay, is it is it my second floor? And how much is it six and six or is it eight and eight? Is it whatever? And how many floors is it? Is it my sixth one built or my fifth, fifth yeah. one built that triggers the end of the game? And I just... I feel like there could have been something that they could have done to make it clearer sure. to where it's like maybe I, I get thematically this is your ground floor, this is your first floor, your tableau, right. but it's just I struggle with that at least. And I'm, okay. I, I don't think I'm the only one that has a, it, you know, struggles with it. Until I got to use the ruler, uh -huh. I would always have to look at the board and recalculate it and... Yeah, I agree with that. So the little cheater sticks help. That helps me big time. Okay, yeah. all right. Um, ground floor has a rep for being a bit dry. You know, there's, <laughs> there's nothing. Uh, there's no like, wow, did you really just pull that off? Type moves and right. stuff like that, which, um, which doesn't bother uh, either one of us. I don't think dorks right, like yeah. us. You know, we we don't mind dry games like that. Um, but that's certainly um, maybe a, a negative for some. And I wonder if that might be one of one of two reasons, possibly, on why I see it for sale so much uh, secondhand mm -hmm. in BGG auctions and whatnot. The other reason being that I wonder if maybe there's a false sense of what the game is. And what I mean by that is, oh, yeah. it's you you look at it and you think. It's an economic game, right? And it's it's not. It's a it's a business theme, worker placement, maybe resource conversion yes. game. And I kind of hit on that in my original overview. Right. And so I feel like if you're if you go into the game expecting it to be an economic game, you you're going to be surprised. Right. And I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. I I would say it's a bad thing in a sense that if you expect it to be one thing, it should be that thing. Yeah. If you go in expecting it and it's not. Even if you don't mind that type of game, it might turn you off yeah. to the game because you expected it to be something else. Yeah, I think, you know, for, for you and me, when we think of an economic game, we're thinking of cash value, right? Some sort of company valuation is the winning conditions. 18xx, Arc, right? Panamax, yeah. even, right? right? Yeah, right. you know, that to us, that's an economic game. This has some economic elements to it, but the victory conditions are victory points. Right. And, you know, like that, the stage three floors are all about bonus victory points mm -hmm. on top of the things you've already maybe built. And so it's that last round, even or the last two rounds where you're trying to build the, those the final floors in your in your company. It's kind of gamey in terms of, oh, I can get this one and that's times three. So that's 15 victory points right there, you know, right. so as opposed to a monetary valuation of, a, of like an economic game. Yeah, and, and again, I think that might be maybe the second or maybe a different reason as to why I see so many, which is a shame because it's a really good game. I really enjoy this oh, game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I wonder if maybe a couple of those reasons might be, and I don't know if that's necessarily on the publisher as far as, you know, maybe they, they, they represented it wrong or if it's on us, the players, who might have the wrong preconceived notion of what the game is. I don't know which it is, but I feel like there is that just disconnect. I feel like it's, it's yeah, Fair. and I, I don't know where it comes from, but as long as you understand what it is that you're sure. getting into, it's a really good game. Uh, something else that sends me once okay. in a while is uh, late in the game, Maybe you've got several employees, so you've got an abundance of time. <laughs> and um, the the advertising is seems almost uh, a non-decision sometimes. I'm going to send these workers over there. It's kind of a pissing match of who's going where. and To um, be able to keep up in the player turn order, yeah, you're saying, it's just, right? You know, it's, it's like, I have to do this. I have to do this. I have to do this. I don't. Uh, it loses scripted? some of loses some of its punch. It's not uh, so. Yeah, maybe scripted. Do you feel like like you have to be able to keep up it's with just, the Joneses? It's just forced, yeah. non decision. Okay, yeah. all right, and I I can see that. 
You got anything else? No. All right. Well, I think that's a good thing. All right. So my summary for the for ground floor is that this is a literally and figuratively very well assembled game. <laughs> <laughs> the theme is uh, quite apparent to me and in, in my tastes. The gameplay, the mechanics are definitely in my wheelhouse. This is great competitive fun, even with six. And I, I really think that's an unusual accomplishment. Yeah, I. The six thing is still kind of has me shocked, yeah. to be honest. For, so for a summary for me, I would say as long as you're looking for a business-themed game and you're a fan of worker placement and resource conversion, then I think this is a really, really good representative uh, in that genre. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. So on a scale of one to six, one on the low end, six on the high, my rating for this game is that I'd really love to give the game a five because I, I think it's fantastic. Um, if However. The, if the victory point thing was more economic. Okay. But isn't that on you? No. You don't think so? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Don't make me think that. <laughs> Go um, ahead, I'm never wrong. No. Um, I, the game would definitely be a five for me given everything else if the victory point thing was more economic than, than victory points. Mm -hmm. And so... I, I, I'm going to give it a four, which is an awesome, very, very good game that should be considered for a collection. All right. Um, for different reasons, but similar results, okay. I, I had it at like four and three quarters, so that makes it a four. So if it's right. not a five, 4.99 4. is a four. Is a four, right. Um, I feel like it's... Like I said in my summary, a really good representative for what it is. Yeah. Um, it's a really good game. And the thing that almost sends it to a five for me is the fact that it plays six really well as long as you keep it moving. And I have it. Um, I'm glad I own it. And mm -hmm. I will not be getting rid of my... You will not see my copy in a BGG auction anytime soon. I will not acquire this for $25 in an auction? Damn. Sorry. Well, no, it's not to say you won't. You just won't acquire that, that one. one. <laughs> right. Right on. All right. So that's Heavy Cardboard's take on Ground Floor. All right. So I thought that was a pretty good, fun discussion on Ground Floor. Good breakdown uh, on the review. I enjoyed it a lot. So good back and forth on a couple I, of things too. I, I think so yeah, yeah. and hopefully That's hopefully, always fun. hopefully the listeners yeah. enjoy it as well we're good friends but we don't always see eye to eye which is makes for good conversation right. i think right um so time for ask the elephant and as our listeners know this is where uh fans of the show can come in and go into our bgg guild and pose questions to us mm -hmm. in the thread that ask the elephant for right. the upcoming episode it could be about the game or whatever it could be about god okay. knows anything we haven't had it too many off the wall but i figure by me saying that now now yeah. we will thanks 42 the answer is always 42 <laughs> all right so brian at h asks which medium or heavy game do you enjoy solo or at least have heard from others offer a good solo option? I've heard some say that Glass Road has a good solo option, for instance. So let me preface and say that you and I are not, outside of the occasional war game or maybe playing it by ourselves to learn the game, we don't play much by way of solo games. No. That's not to say, not to disparage them, just right. we don't do it. I like people around the table. I need that. Right. And that's part of the reason I don't play a lot of board games online, like Board Game Arena, yeah, et cetera. Yeah, no, I'm saying. So I know that Mage Knight is popular, uh, as are a lot of Uwe Rosenberg games, uh, right. Gates of Loyang, Fields Grick of Barlow. Fields of right. Barlow. Um, however, I'll be honest, and we don't plug other shows too often on, on our show, mm -hmm. but... Um, when it comes to solo gaming, um, our, a fan of the show, Buddy uh, Travis, he and a couple of his friends or w fellow gaming partner, mm -hmm. whatever, uh, they started a new podcast called Low Player Count. Yes, and did. I would really recommend checking that out. Yeah. And also, to be honest, Bryant, maybe start a thread in our guild and ask folks. There are plenty of people that play uh, solo games. Yeah, yeah. Um, so like I said, outside of war gaming, we don't do much. So I bet you that would be an awesome place to ask. I, I did try Fields of Arla solo one time, but I felt like it was a training game. I, you know, I was learning how to play the game 
through the solo game to be able to teach it for well, the most part. I actually right? played it. I I set it up to play solo okay. because I wanted to experience it solo, mm -hmm. and that's why it felt like a training game to me. So okay, all right. Maybe not all solo games are created equal. Oh yeah. Well, Brian F has a question for us. It's a, he says, "What games are you looking forward to playing at HeavyCon?" Yes. And is there anything <laughs> newish that will get its debut play for you guys at the con? All right, so you take this one first. All right, I am I'm looking forward, as we said, to playing all of the games on that list. But I, I did pick one that I want to play in particular, and that's Container. I just think it's a brilliant sandbox oh, it's, game. It, it's, it's fantastic. Just, just amazing. A uh, good economic game. It is an economic... Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> on so many levels. Um, and, you know, potentially we're going to play um, a prototype from the Heavy Cardboard Lab. If people want to, we're not going to push want it. To. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So for me, um, and this is as much the game as it is the player, players, I should say, in this. Um, and that's going to be Demoker yeah. for me, the game I'm probably most looking forward to. I mean, there's a ton of games that I'm looking forward to playing. Yeah. But uh, Mike, who I think asks a question here later on, mm -hmm. I call him German Mike right. because that we have a million Mikes. Uh, in our in our game group, and so it yeah. helps me keep them separate. So German Mike, I played with him, Kevin, Open Face Chad, and a couple other guys at uh, BGG Con, a uh, a game of Demoker, and we just had such a good time. I'm so excited to play that nice. again, um, partially because he's going to be in the game, and just really looking forward to it. As far as what other games that are going to be new to yes. me that I'm looking forward to, Maria. It sat on my shelf yeah. for. Over a year, haven't gotten it to the table yet. Plus, I don't have to teach it. You know, I don't have to learn from the rule book. Right, right. God's Playground, Namibia, got it right, Ooh. Uh, which is a, a cool mining game that's hard to get here in the States that I have a copy of. I'm anxious to get it played. High Frontier yeah. is a game that, again, I don't want to learn it from the rule book. I want no. someone to teach it to me. Yeah. So I know there's some interest on people teaching that. High Frontier so, is going to factor to another question. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to that. But, I mean, and like you said, I, I hope we get some folks interested in trying our, our version or riff off of a different take of Indonesia. Right on. So yeah. if not, so be it. But if so, great. Awesome. So Eric L. asks, basically, you gents often refer to both Venus and Kanban, but what are your thoughts on CO2? Well, for me, I've only played it once, and it really didn't go over real well with our gaming group, and I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, I think maybe it had to do with the semi-co-op nature of the mm. game. And let's face it, you and I in particular, Amanda's not. Most people in our group, Paul Chad, all that aren't big into co-ops. No. So I think the semi-co-op nature of the game kind of turned people off, but also the lack of control and being able to build specific plants uh, when you want to uh, frustrated some people. Like, th there's a three-step process in, in, in the game. And if I do step one or step two, you can come in and do step three. And some people... It didn't sit well, the fact that, okay. well, why am I yeah. doing that for you to help you out type thing? Um, I'm willing to play it. Mm. Again, I'm willing to try it because the Are dynamics... You? I am, because the, the dynamics of our game group have changed uh, away from the people I played it with the first time. So I'm willing to give it another go. Okay. But, yeah, it just didn't hit me. It didn't, you know... Well, catch You me, know, hearing all that and some other feedback on the game... I. I really am not interested in playing it, you know, in the in the semi co op. I we like to co op each other into the poor house when we're playing, <laughs> not you know, other ways. So um I I wouldn't say I'd not play it, but someone would have to bring it to the table and convince me to play it. Well it is it is Vital's game yeah. and we are fans of his game. Yeah. So that would be why I'm not saying that I'm not willing to try it. Fair enough. You know, deference to Vital. Okay. He's awesome. Right. T C Quick question, quick answer from this kid. What is currently your favorite game from Tasty Minstrel Games? I'm, I'm curious what yours is. Village. Really? With Port and the Inn. Okay. That made my final two. Yeah. For me, I'll be honest, and it has nothing to do with the fact that we just reviewed it, but it's close, 
but I think I lean towards ground floor. All right, cool. um, I enjoy Village as well. I played uh, a handful of Tasty Minstrels. I played. We played Aquasphere, right. Captains of Industry, Orleans, Scoville, Village. Enjoy them all, but I think ground floor is probably my favorite. Still want to try Homesteaders. Yeah, have it. Haven't played That's it yet. That's one we need to play. Yeah. So, but yeah. Uh, so Village for you and uh, ground floor for Clear me. Clear cut. Really? For me. Huh. All right. Number two would be ground floor. Okay. David A. asks, since you started doing reviews, is there a game that you've given a positive review to hmm. and now feel overstays its welcome with you? I, I pose that question to you, sir. To me? To you. Um, in thinking about this, the answer to this question, I only consider the games that we did as our main feature game. So none of the trailer games or anything like okay. that. Okay. All right. And, and my answer is no. Of the games that I personally thought highly of, they're all still on my playlist. Okay. And, yeah, I... Nothing overstays. I'm not tired of any of those. I went through all our episodes. I went through our trailers and the stuff that I, you know, uh, did trailers for as well as main feature reviews. And I can honestly say no. Um, now, sometimes there are... I'm never always in the mood to play a game even my even through the ages or dominant species there are times i just don't want to play the game mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean i think less of it or it's fallen out of favor i'm right. just not in the mood to play the game right, right now. now um yeah i just but there's nothing that i wasn't already ugh, on and the one specific that comes to mind for me is master of economy we reviewed it, we played it a bunch, and we just it just didn't sit well with us no. to begin with. And I since sold it because I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm not interested. So it didn't increase at all. It didn't decrease, but it didn't increase after playing it either. So Matt C. asked us, have you guys ever been drawn in by the art on a game only to find something you did not expect, good, bad, or otherwise? And I actually have a good, bad, and an otherwise Seriously. In the answer for this question. I, kudo, extra credit for you, because I, I do not. So, okay, right. go for it. I'm curious what these are. So, drum roll oh, is dude. stunningly pretty and stunningly dull. It Yes, that I, is perfect on both it. I will parts. never sell my Kickstarter Deluxe Edition, because I just like to open it up and go, God, this game is beautiful. Why are you not good? <laughs> it's not that it's not good. It's just dull. Yeah. It's just blah. Yeah, it's not good. That Had I thought about it, I would have included that. Yes. Uh, Cashgar is one I had some interest in, and, the, and it's just gorgeous. And that's on the plus scale. Yeah. I, I like didn't have high hopes, and it's Didn't know better. what to expect. Okay. You know? Mm -hmm. Marco Polo. Okay. Stunningly gorgeous. I have no idea if this game's it's, gonna what it, side the game's gonna fall on. It looks good, but I don't think it's that pretty. Well, until you fondle all the pieces and <laughs> and examine the the detail, dude. The detail on, really? on on the yeah yeah Dennis Lohausen. Okay, out, out of, of the, the park. park for you know for a guy who doesn't like baseball. I digress. Well, you yeah can't, <laughs> can't kick a football out of a stadium. <laughs> So for me, I said I, I really don't think so. Um, however, I kind of went about this in a different way because I can't. I couldn't think of anything art-wise. Had mm -hmm. I thought of drum roll, that would have been it. Okay, right. but I didn't. So because I couldn't think of anything, I, I thought that was kind of a weak answer. So I, I went a different direction okay. with this. And with that, I, I've gone into a game expecting one type of game and finding a totally different type of game. Okay. And the one that came to mind most recently was Rolling Stock. <laughs> so, and the art is not a draw on that. No, game. no, no. It's it, it, it's as bland as it's just it's yeah, it's yeah. stock certificates the end, right? And, and company charters and that's it. So, I thought going into it it was a stock trading kind of an investing game and found out it's not that at all. And I don't know if that's boo on me for expecting something that it wasn't or if it was being – I was told that it's 18xx without the operations. Right. Take the board out of it and it's all the stock market stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I was super, super excited to play it. Yeah. And then I found out, oh, it's not really like that. It's – I'm not willing to write it off yet. I want to try it again. Right. But yeah, that one really struck me as just – 
not what I expected it to be going in. And because of that, I felt like it was a bit of a letdown. But again, that's That's, because of the preconceived notions I had. That's a good one because I I had the scene the first time I played it, I was 18xx without the tracker. Right, right. right? And like, huh. It was hard. It's a hard, hard game. (laughs) Yeah. But uh, nothing what I expected either. Good one. Good one. All right. All right. So Marty D asks. What games that are in print <laughs> and available would you recommend for someone looking uh, for heavy economic games similar to Indonesia and other splatter games? Right. I'm considering Arkwright, and you should. It did win the Golden hey, Elephant in 2014. Stop considering it and, and purchase go get it. it. Yeah. If you're looking heavy economic, that's that's, that's our a rock star. Yeah. Yeah. But I was hoping for additional suggestions. He said, ground floor looks like a possibility, Mm -hmm. and I'm looking forward to your review. Well, here is a perfect example that I touched on that he thinks it's a heavy economic, and it's not. It's a business sim. So, And when I read this, that kind of triggered that, and I was like, wait a minute. Right. So here you go. Here's what I got. Heavy economic and in print. In print being the key. Good thing you specified. Because we we've been getting a lot of you know Flat. good good hearted yeah. grief on right. Twitter right. Right. about wait a minute, is it out of print where there are only four copies and they were all made by a one eyed pirate named you know Bill? Yeah. <laughs> if so, then heavy cardboard will review it. That's right. But on the flip side. During uh, post Essen, we're reviewing a lot of those games, and people give us grief because same we're cult of the new, so we can't win either way. So, getting back to your question, Marty, heavy economic and in print, Arkwright, excellent start. Yeah. Uh, there are multiple 18xxs that are available, mm-hmm. whether it's 1830 or my vote for the best entry level game is 1846. Mm-hmm. It's not cheap; it's about 121 bucks, but it's Available right. and in print, you can get it right away. Brass, yep. I thought was another good one. Brass is and, awesome. And tell me what you think of this one. And I might not have gone heavy in this one, but it's a game we've played a bunch. Okay. Planet Steam. Oh, yeah. What do you think? It's more medium, but it has cool sure. stock market manipulation, kind yeah. of a uh, uh, dystopian type, you know, yeah. get, uh, theme. But I, I've. I enjoy Planet Steam a lot. And, I mean, the pieces are amazing, too. Right. But, yeah, that market mechanic is pretty darn cool. So I, I think that might fit. And that's... I think Matt's still looking for water. <laughs> <laughs> so how about you? You have anything else to add to that? Um, you know, one of the points in his questions was like Indonesia. And, and when we covered it, it was... It, it, we said it's a pretty unique beast, so I'm going to be really hard pressed to think of anything that's like Indonesia. But I like a lot of the things you what, well, you hold covered. On. Hold on, like Indonesia. You know, well, I hear there's a game in development. Anyway, anyway. moving on. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, you mentioned 1846. Being uh, that I, I'm an 18xx noob. And I've played 1846 and I've played 1879. I like 1879 intro better than 1846 just because it's got the evil that I'm really looking for in an 18xx game. I'm not not saying anything bad about no, no, 46. I know. You can't get copies of 79 is the problem. It's a winsome... Yeah, t- I, and, I, fair enough. And it's only... He did say in print. Right, but... So. It also requires you to own 1830 because it does yeah. not come with the majority of the parts. It's Oops. almost like a yeah. variant. But 1830 would be a good one to start with, too. We'll agree to disagree. We'll get into right. that in a future episode. Uh, Panamax is the is the one I, I came up with. It is a huh. it is an economic game. It is. It has parts of an economic game. And, uh, you know, it's got stock and sure. um, money, cash flow, and, and it's got personal money, and it's got business money. Sure, yeah. I could see that. I. I thought about it originally. And it's awesome. Well, agreed. But I figured I thought the actual shipping and all that was more the focus than the stock market, or not stock, but the the stocks yeah, and sure, all in the sure, economic sure. side. It has economic aspects mm-hmm. to it. So yeah, yeah. I, and yeah, I think that's, and it's probably more medium heavy mm-hmm. than than heavy. Yeah, yeah. But no, I think that's a, a fair recommendation. So uh, I believe this is the world famous German Mike. It is Michael yes. M. Yes. He says, uh, <laughs> "Guys, what are your thoughts on Phil Eklund? Do you like his games? Which of his games have you played, or would you like to play?" I have 
no idea what to think of Phil Eklund. Um, I want to play High Frontier and the BIOS Megafauna, American Megafauna things. I've only ever played PAX uh, Perfiana, but... Um, Perfuriana, whatever the heck it is. Sure. I, it's, it's one of those words for me. I was, I was but, going to let it like, slide. <laughs> this guy is... He's so smart. Like, some of his rules, you have all these... Some of his games, you have all these, like, living rule sets because we can't understand what he's saying, so we have to, like, rewrite them. Well, I mean... To his so defense, I don't know what to think. He he truly is a rocket scientist, well, a yeah. retired rocket sure. scientist. Um, yeah, I. That's funny. why he's so smart, right? You bring those up, and I honestly have only played Pax Porfiriana as well. Um, I own High Frontier, Bios Megafauna, Greenland, which I've heard Green, eh, whatever. Yeah, there's a couple so, yeah. more coming out that I'm anxious to try, <laughs> mm-hmm. but I probably High Frontier is the one that's I'm that's most number excited. One. To try, and I know it's more simulation than game, but I still want to experience it and find out if I like it. Yeah. Um, so I can't really answer it right now, but give us a couple months, and after you teach us that, Mike, uh, High Frontier, we we might be able to give you more more of a informed Indeed. answer on Indeed. that. All right. So for our final one, uh, trying to ans- uh, asked a few different questions. So here we go. Number one: Has a game ever been too heavy for you guys, even if it wasn't? necessarily too complicated and i said not really um there are times we're too tired to play something and we have no business trying to play it when we do and that's on us that's not on the game um but otherwise not really yeah the the one that's come closest though is clinic uh the reason is is there's a 3d spatial aspect to this game to where it just it's hard and it if you're if you're not fresh, or at least for me right. and, and Amanda, it, it, Amanda actually made the comment that it broke her brain, the yeah. 3D aspect of it. And it just, unless you're fresh, it, that one might be too hard. It's like a Star Trek chess game, but all laid flat where you have to like line up those things. It's, right. It's hard to think about that. So anything for you on that? Um, I, I just said no, just in general, because we're pretty careful about who we introduce to what and and how we build up people you know like as far as like step them up in, in right. difficulty and weight in yeah, game yeah yeah um so part two he says sometimes for kicks i search for board games with a weight rating higher mm-hmm. than four and then do the same search but filter out all war games in 18xx games or train games the difference is staggering he says why are so many games deemed super heavy in the field of war gaming or 18xx so I'll start with the 18xx. Side. All right. There's a lot of math. Math mm-hmm. is hard. Um, and more, most importantly, to play well, you really have to play not only your game, but you have to play everybody else's game as well. And uh, sure, I mean, there are a lot of games out there where you're trying to do similar, but the cascading effects of a decision that you make now might not really bear fruit until four hours down the road. Mm-hmm. And they're not always obvious what these effects or right. what these right decisions are. And it's just, it's really, really hard to grasp. And not to mention the economics of the game are just, they're just hard. And um, brutal. Enjoyable. And unforg- unforgiving. And that being another kicker mm-hmm. right there. there. There is no luck. There is no random. If you fall behind, hope, unless... Hope you have fun for the next three hours. Yeah. Or, or, or in an 18... I mean, it, it, here's a or good more. example. 1830, new players, and the reason I don't recommend it for beginner players is if you're playing with anybody with any ex, uh, experience, mm-hmm. if you bid $5 too much for a private company at the beginning of the game, you may have just lost the game and you don't know it for six hours. That's why you play the short game. Hmm. It's when you learn. Anyway, when you learn. So, but that is a good example. There is no catch-up mechanic and no nothing. Right. So that's why in 18xx, it, the weight is mm-hmm. a little bit mm-hmm. skewed. Uh, I I think generally those games, 18xx and war games, are just they're more rules complexity. Yeah, and, rules dense. Right. Absolutely. And um, and some and often longer mm-hmm. than typical European games, and that's what makes people think they're heavy. I would also say that there's exceptions for exceptions for exceptions in a lot of rule game or in a lot of war games. Games like Pass the Glory, supposed to be a phenomenal game, 
but there are so many exceptions mm -hmm. that it makes the rules dense. And that's where I think the, the complexity comes from. It's all in the rules overhead more so than the actual gameplay. Right. Um, but yeah, I've, I've said previously on our show that there should be two different scales. There is a Euro weight and then there is a war game rate, mm. uh, a weight that a war game that's weighted at 3.0 is probably a 5.0 for euros. Sure. And they're completely, there's no crossover there whatsoever. Cool. All right. So for the last one, or I'm sorry, next to the last one. He's got two more pieces. He does. All right. You want to take it? Sure. All right. Uh, still with Trinet. He was thinking how a lot of new and in parentheses heavier game, or Euro games uh, tend to have a lot of mechanics that try to fit together and are seemingly about less about one central idea with the mechanics reinforcing that main idea. He's thinking about things in particular like Terra Mystica, he calls out, and some What's Your Game published titles. Do you think there is feature creep element to the heavy Euros of today? I think it's a great question. Um, I do think there's a difference between more of the more classic uh, Euros and the more modern Euros. Mm -hmm. Take a couple games like El Grande or Kalis, mm -hmm. to where they are all central around one mechanic and done it really, really well. Right. Whereas now... Uh, you take a game like Madeira, which is a what's your game game, and you have a bunch of different mechanics meshed together, mm -hmm. but meshed together really, really mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. I think there's a place for both of them, and I think you and I come, or we look at it from a, hey, we really dig that integration, and so we might lean more uh, towards that integration, but I do think that there is a disconnect and I don't know when this took place when this transition from yeah. more one mechanic to sure. this but it, it's been fairly recent but I don't know like where that line was yeah I think it's uh, uh, something that is in modern game design now in general you know we often hear the term in fact, maybe too often, it's a mishmash of mechanics or complexity for complexity's sake which so, I hate both those yeah it's the landscape of, of, what's to, of what's going on in design today. Sometimes it works out, sometimes not so much. Yeah, and just because a game's heavy doesn't mean we like it. <laughs> right. uh, let's see, the last question then is, <laughs> how the heck do you guys get players for these things so frequently? By things, I'm assuming he means all the games we've been playing and right. talking about. And, well, uh, we have a, a, a circle of like-minded friends and, and friends of the show as well as just of us that... We get together regularly and play games. Yeah, it, I mean, it all stemmed from one local game group. Yeah. Um, and they tend to skew a little bit lighter. Mm -hmm. for the mo not always, but a little right. bit. And we found some of us in there skew heavier centric. Right. And so we kind of splintered off, I guess is kind of a yeah. way to put it. Um, We'd always end up gaming in different areas in the same house anyway. Yeah, right, so. right, right. Um, but it, it helps also that I have a wonderful wife that digs heavy games, mm -hmm. so I have a built-in partner right. for those. And, you know, we live less than 10 minutes away from each other, so we always have access to basically a three-player game yep. almost all the time. Um, but to be honest with you, we're just really lucky in that respect, I guess. Although there are, there are some game groups out there that, you know, there's the first Minnesota up you know, in Minnesota, there's the Dallas Gamers Group. Somewhere there. Um, to where they there are a bunch of like-minded folks. We have a, a core of about five or six people, um, maybe seven, depending on the time of year when, when sweater mics and sound. Right. Uh, but, yeah, it's it's we're just lucky, I guess. So, yay on us. Right on. So. Thanks for the questions, guys. Yeah, that was, that, that was fun. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it and... We answered them well, I guess. I hope. All right. Before we get out of here, let's remind everybody about the contest. Yeah. So real simple. You're going to e or you need to email us contest at heavycardboard.com. Answer two questions. One, how'd you hear about the show? Mm -hmm. And second, what are you most looking forward to playing in 2015? Doesn't have to be a 2015 release. Could be just new to you. Sure. You do those two things. We'll randomly pull out a, uh, a name. Uh, you know, do a random mm -hmm. generator, or whatever, and next episode we'll announce the winner. Get a brand new copy of Shipyard, courtesy of uh, Game Surplus and Heavy Cardboard. And speaking of Game Surplus, just one more time, visit those guys, www.gamesurplus.com. 
great people, great games, great prices. Tell them Heavy Cardboard sent you. And, uh, yeah, just a uh, shout-out to Amos and uh, Velma. Thanks for being partners. We're happy with it. They're happy with it. Everyone drives home in the Cadillac. Tell folks how to contact us. Sure. Uh, Twitter, we are really active on there. At Heavy Cardboard. Facebook, Heavy Cardboard. Uh, email, heavycardboard at gmail.com. That'll be changing, but not yet. And last but not least, the website, heavycardboard.com. Go there to check out for the YouTube channel uh, once we get that hammered out in the next mm -hmm. couple days. And other than that, uh, take a moment and rate and, if you would, review us on iTunes. Please. We definitely appreciate it. And other than that, I guess we'll catch you guys in a couple weeks, maybe with uh, maybe Puerto Rico, I'm thinking. What do you think? Uh, potentially so. Yeah. Uh, my daughter's graduating college, and parents are coming in and everything, so my gaming time is going to be limited. So I need to, I need to cover a game that's going to have a, a lot of familiarity with me, and that sounds like a, it's an awesome title. It's good to have those in our pocket. It I is. I mean, we'll still play it a couple more times to, to get it fresh, but maybe not. I, we've played it a bunch, so... Let us know what you guys think of the additional video format, and uh, I had a really good time, man. Yeah, man. Enjoyed it. Um, we'll catch you guys in a couple weeks. Later.